is all right welcome to the weird libertarians we're doing the covid 19 daily updates here uh we have a slew of people and i could introduce them one by one real quick but let's go ahead since we are going to be talking about the virus updates let's i'm going to point on one and we're going to have them share their experiences so far with this situation. Uh, Keaton, you are new to the uh, We're Libertarians Network. He runs Freedom Strips, a program if you haven't been watching. You're missing out big time. Uh, but we've recently acquired him. Our big fat conglomerate has, con has, uh, has consumed his small mom and pop network. Uh, he's a fantastic podcaster. Uh, Keaton, you're based in Florida someplace, but go ahead and tell me your situation and uh, what's Corona done for you? What's uh, been the impact on your life? Yeah, yeah. Jacksonville, Florida is where I'm located. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Keaton Tucker. I run Freedom Strips, as Hody said. Uh, I'm located in Jacksonville, Florida. And as far as like the effect that I've seen personally in Jacksonville, I work for uh, the PGA Tour. So um, we just recently obviously canceled the players championship if you know golf at all that is a huge huge event um located right outside of jacksonville in ponte Vedra beach they did their first round of golf and uh the commissioner announced that they were going to move forward with the event without fans and literally the next day announced that they were going to cancel the uh, event altogether and then subsequently uh, canceled all the events through the middle of uh, May. So tremendous, tremendous effect as far as the local uh, economy. My wife works for a local restaurant group. The local restaurants are definitely feeling it, especially with uh, Jacksonville mayor said that they're going along with the recommendation of no groups uh, greater than 10 people. So, you know, these, these restaurants are, are kind of uh, struggling with that. Um, so definitely local economy is struggling. I know those in the service industry are feeling it as well with lost hours, you know, small businesses having to cut back to, to save funds. So uh, Jacksonville is definitely feeling the hurt as well as uh, I know uh, the rest of these guys here in their local communities, they're feeling it as well. Yeah. Uh, he might not have all day. So I do want to go to, uh, you'll know him and love him, Chris Spangle uh, in Indiana. Chris, what's been your personal experience with this? Well, I grew up going to St. Augustine, Florida, which is just a little bit south of where Keaton is. And it's one of my favorite places on earth. And my mom, we were going to celebrate her 60th birthday in St. Augustine. We had a condo there growing up. And so we were going to go back and my mom is uh, likely to can uh, likely to cancel that trip. Um, this is uh, the first family vacation that we were going to have since I, I mean, probably in 20 years at least. Um, so disappointed about that, that we're, you know, but that's a few thousand dollars that the community of St. Augustine's going to lose. I've, I've personally lost uh, gig income. You know, my main job is going to be safe. Uh, thankfully, there are many generous people who uh, continue to give to Patreon to help keep this afloat. I um, want to thank Reinhold, who up from $25 to $100 a month, and he's now $100 a month uh, a subscriber to Patreon, as is Christy Avery uh, and Craig DaCosta, and I'll, I'll pull that up and just give the full list here while I'm thinking about it. Um, but it's been a wild, wild week. I don't think that I've ever experienced anything like this because I am... Uh, I, everybody's at home and enjoying their uh, sitting around. I am, I've never worked harder <laughs> because I work at a radio show. And so we're trying to get um, everybody to have the ability to broadcast that's on the show live to the studio. I'm about to start working from home. I'm an extreme extrovert. So I'm not looking forward to being stranded at home for probably several months. Uh, and you know, so lost vacations, lost income, um, complete disruption of schedule. My, my entire calendar went from totally full to absolutely nothing, which is partly why I said to everybody, let's, let's do this. Let's do a hangout. I think it is a fundamental shift that the way that a lot of us are going to live. I think as a millennial, I've never walked into a store. I've never not had the ability to buy whatever I want, whenever I want it. And as a student of history, I think we're about to live through a few months that most P 
people in human history have experienced, we've just been blessed to not really have to deal with it. We've had abundance. We've had, um, you know, we've had profitable careers, many of us. We've had uh, protection, really, from disease in, in this kind of disease. I mean, this was a very common way of life for people. And I think we've been a very safe society since 1960, 1970 on uh, for the majority of people. And it is, I think, very scary to a lot of people because they, they don't study history, they don't appreciate where they're at, and we're about to appreciate some of those smaller things more. Um, personally, the toughest moment of the week was having dinner with my mom on Monday, who is a registered nurse, and she's 60. She's a smoker. She's, um, you know, high blood pressure. She's in, she's in the high risk category, and her job means she's going to be on the front lines. And so, you know, I know at the very least because of quarantines, I'm not going to see her for a period of months. And so it was difficult to, to have that last dinner with her, but it also was, you know, I mean, the moment was not lost on me that she's going into battle, essentially. And, uh, you know, you think of people going into battle and they're, they're 22 years old, they're men, they're tough, not 60 year old nurses. And uh, so I just want to say thank you to everybody who is a healthcare provider who's going to be on the front lines of what's about to come. Um, you know, I read an article today in Deutsche Welle that conservative estimates or worst case scenario estimates, I mean, in Iran are 3.2 million deaths, uh, which is just a stunning number. And it, it, it just boggles the mind. So I'm, I'm hoping for the best. I'm preparing for the worst. Um, I'm a person that eats out every night, you know, and now I've, I've, I had to buy a freezer and buy some food. And I'm, I'm one of those people that was living the good life. And now I've got to figure out how to live a different life, like my, like my grandparents and great grandparents in a manner of a week. And so it's been a hard emotional adjustment, I think, for everybody. And that's part of why we're going to do this every night at seven o'clock for people. Um, we're going to do a daily show, kind of get caught up on the news and, and have a conversation about their shared experience to make it easier for people. Uh, and, and like I said, it's brought to you by our Patreons. We want to thank them so much. We want to thank Craig DaCosta, Ed Brehob, Jason Doolittle, Jeff Bennett, Christy Avery, Matthew Durbin, and now Reinhold, um, especially for being $100 a month contributors. I know I, I'm, I'm good friends with most of these folks. I know that's a, a big uh, an investment, you know, or a big chunk. And especially at a time when, you know, the treasury secretary says worst case scenario is 20% unemployment. Um, so I just want to thank them for that because part of what we're going to be doing here every night at seven is having a, a little online community for people who feel disconnected and are trying to make sense of what's going on. So um, yeah, it's just yeah. been a wild ride. Yeah. Those are good guys. There's uh they say give till it hurts. Those guys give when it hurts. And that is really important. So yeah, thanks to all them. Uh, we got another guy with some uh, real great name recognition. Uh, Remzo Martinez, he owns the Remzo Republic. You probably read him, heard him, gotten around. You've seen something of his that has went viral at some Hated point. Him. <laughs> Maybe you hated him at some point because that's how that's how you really get famous uh, is by having an appropriate uh, rivalry. Maybe even with we are libertarians, but like all good rivals, they eventually succumb to the uh, the call of wall. So, uh, Remzo, uh, where are you from? How are things out there, man? Well, thank you, Howdy, and it's my honor to become an inquisitor of the Wall Nation. I know some of you are, you know, rather surprised to see me here in the company of such degenerates. But what I can tell you is I love you and fuck off. We're having a great time here. This is uh, this has actually been a very interesting week. It's only Wednesday. And for those of you that don't know, I've been working at the Washington Times for almost a year now. And I pretty much work in the newsroom at night from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. Sunday through Thursday. So for about a week now, I've been teleworking and it's I, I did not anticipate that I would be working as hard because usually when you're at home, you're a little bit more relaxed. You feel like you have more control over things. Me and the rest of both the commentary team and the newsroom team have been tripling our output because of the amount of 
information and misinformation that is circulating amongst our population. And this has been a very trying time for journalism. I've seen a lot of people really excel, a lot of people really, you know, um, answer the call when needed. And I've also seen a lot of people just do some, you know, very questionable things that have been somewhat disappointing. But what I can tell you is that this is a, this is a moment for, I think, everyone in media. I don't think I've seen the type of behaviors. I have not seen the type of actions by so many people in the news world that could be comparable to that of how our nation was not to, you know, not to draw too many comparisons to 9-11, where actual reporters are actually having to go out and gather information, wait on a story for a little bit if it means reporting it when they have the story straight. So this has been, uh, it's been a hectic couple of days. I've been working a little bit more than my regular hours because my team has needed me. And even though we're all teleworking right now, I mean, it's been, it's been, rather, it's been rather stressful because uh, several weeks ago, I was not only working at CPAC, but I did meet with Senator Ted Cruz the Friday morning before President Trump showed up. So there was nothing stranger than me reading an email from Matt Schlatt from the American Conservative Union saying that somebody there had tested positive for coronavirus. And not even three days later, Senator Ted Cruz went into quarantine. So immediately I walk into the newsroom and everyone looks at me like, sup, patient zero. And after that, I was working from home. But I do have to really be thankful for what I have around me. I myself have had no sickness, no fever, no symptoms. I was at really the epicenter of where a lot of confusion, a lot of hysteria was happening. And even though I definitely had my moments of freaking out, um, I'm at the point now where I'm focused on my work, focused on my family. My family, um, we've been able to prepare for moments like this, so we're going to be okay. Uh, my father and I are able to telework from home. My brother is doing online classes. He's a full-time undergrad student. So really, all we've had to do is sacrifice some convenience, and that's what I've had to label it as. Nothing, nothing vital to my life, nothing necessary for my life has been sacrifice only just some conveniences so all i can do is be thankful for what i have being right outside of dc in northern virginia and just put out as much work and as much effort as i can to give people the news and the opinions that they need to make sure that they can really you know keep a level head in the situation yeah it's critical man all right thank you so much um this guy in the network uh he's been here for a while jacob if you've seen anything that has to do with kind of foreign policy and the specifics of uh, our military uh, mobilization and, and those type of affairs. Jacob's really been really great at kind of knowing the manual and giving us some, some insight on that. Um, so that's his introduction. But Jacob, where are you at and how are things? Sure. So things are going uh, pretty good. I'm here in uh, Virginia, specifically Richmond area. But uh, yeah, uh, so just my connection to wall. Um, I do like 1% of the amount of research that Sam Schultz does. <laughs> the, I'm good for a post every now and then. But uh, in terms of the, you know, military and all that, the biggest thing is, you know, they're shutting down travel just like everyone else. So uh, in terms of people going from moving from one post to another post or for training. A lot of the stuff is really shut down on the military side too. So I think it's kind of funny when people are like, everyone is mobilizing. It's like, no, we're actually staying put too, you know, <laughs> like uh, there's just much incentive for us to social distance internally as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of other headaches that go along with that, but really in terms of a big movement piece, I mean, we're shutting down in place uh, just as much as everyone else is at this point. Okay, awesome. Uh, and then, of course, everybody knows Paul Copeland. Now, Paul, uh, he got stuck somewhere he's not supposed to be. So, Paul, give us your story. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've been down in Kentucky now for a little while. Uh, okay, am I transmitting? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, good, because it wasn't doing anything on my screen. Uh, Just read love, out your social security number. We'll tell you if it's right. Yeah, that's a good test. Uh, no, I've uh, been stuck in Kentucky now for a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, starting in the beginning of January, I've been uh, knocking doors for a political campaign down here. I'm not going to discuss too much of that because of my contract. But, 
yeah, it's been fun. Uh, I've seen people slowly uh, slipping further and further into paranoia, especially over the last week with all of the closures coming through, uh, going from, hey, yeah, let's stand on your front porch and have a full conversation to, uh, okay, uh, I'll keep the door in between you and I to, okay, we can talk through the glass and yeah, uh, and people are really starting to get on edge here in the last day or two, uh, having cussed out me and a few other people walking. You, you terrorists for just walking around. Um, oh, yeah. So, so uh, I, I'm Hody. I'm out here in Utah. Of course, uh, some good news, some bad news. The good news is here in Utah, we have a lot of people who have that two-year supply of food. That's part of the tenants of the uh, – LDS faith is uh, is keeping a good amount of food supplies around. So uh, we, we've us and a handful of libertarians have been looking forward to this. Now, one of the nice parts is seeing some countries. I don't know it was reported they were on the other side of it, and now it looks like they're kind of making a rebound. But at least we have some kind of sunset on this. This so it's not going to take two years, and it's been nice to be able to say, "Hey, look, I prepared. You didn't." you you're not a monster <laughs> i can help you you know and it's it's created a lot of trust in our communities um jamie uh and i both work in the food service industry so that's kind of the bad news um we're completely out of business uh both work uh tipped wages so 47 percent of two dollars and 13 cents is not exactly enough to even file unemployment for um we're, we're okay financially i think if things were to go like a full month we might start missing payments but uh as far as food wise and survival right now we're going to be okay um so something i'm just going to turn over to the whole group here if you've got any stories this is this is kind of well i guess last night was our first one but i really kind of want to get into the nitty-gritty and personals of it what have you guys seen that has helped during this crisis, either mentality or specific action or just something like that. And anybody can talk here. Anybody. Well, what's been hilarious is the whole toilet paper situation. I, uh, I went to go fill up my car with gas on Monday and this was around the time of the weekend when people were actually starting to notice that toilet paper was disappearing from the shelves. So I, I went to my local BJ's and as I walked into the store, I found it ironic, the stuff that people were buying. Uh, I mean, lots of bottled water, lots of canned food. But the one thing I saw somebody walk out with was a giant plasma screen TV. And I'm just thinking... You know, I didn't think that Doomsday would be this theatrical, but that's rather funny. Then when I went over to the uh, toiletry section, like I, I'm, I'm used to seeing pictures of like Venezuela and Cuba and other socialist countries where there is nothing on the shelves. I did not think that we, where I live, that was anything we'd ever see. Now, the front end of it is the store will restock those shelves the next day. There is no limit to the supply right now it's just the time and convenience of which people are able to grab things so like a bunch of the grocery stores around here even the korean supermarkets they ran out of all frozen meat but you know as long as you get there around the time they open the next day to grab it before everyone else grabs it you'll get your meat so i think that's something a lot of people don't understand they're comparing it to a lot of socialist countries but the problem is not supply the problem is the hoarding mentality we're seeing and nothing freaks me out more than when i saw both giant shelved areas just completely empty and then a sign that i posted on my instagram at hey remso on ig of the sign that said we're limiting everyone to two packs of rolls so you could go out with eight individual rolls so eight rolls of toilet paper and this guy came over and he stood next to me and he's like man i thought this was a joke but the sad thing about it was the joke was on us so then you know i get home my everyone else in my family i live with my family right now uh they all went to different stores and it was really funny seeing the items that we were coming back with my mom just got a bunch of bat just got a bunch of canned spam and rice my brother brought home energy drinks and protein powder. And my father, who was able to get, you know, a lot more bottled water, canned foods and stuff, he got like 10 bags of Doritos, like the giant family packs. And I just looked at him like, who, who e eats Doritos? And he was like, well, I saw somebody else grabbing a bunch. So I thought, you know, maybe I should grab a bunch too, because maybe they're onto something. I'm like, and then you got to the car and then he's like, then I got to the car and realized we don't really eat Doritos. So that was, that was one of those moments where it's like, you know, this is, there, there's humor in everything. 
And, uh, you know, it's, it's been a little moments like that throughout the day. Like, for example, um, you know, we noticed that there was a run on gun stores the last 48 hours. So my family, we're, uh, you know, we're good. We're good Virginians. We have a good supply. So we were taking inventory of everything we had. And then suddenly we were freaking out because we we're like, crap, we don't have a specific type of ammunition. I'm not going to give out details for the one lucky SOB that thinks he wants to come take up, you know, take on my clan of a family. We will fuck you up. But you know, we, we were looking over one crate and we we're like, okay, I think we're doing pretty well. Then we realized in the back of our storage room, there was another ammo crate. And we we're like, oh, I wonder if we put food in there or something. No, we opened it up. And it was like, you know, in cartoons where it's like the light glows from the gold. We just saw everything we need. And we're like, wow, if we have to have an I Am Legends moment, we're good. So just moments like that. Like my father and I both opened up one side of it and we both went, holy shit. It was, it, it was epic. So, I mean, moments like that of fleeting humor and the little silver linings, knowing that, you know, all is pretty okay in the midst of all of this. It, it keeps me going. Awesome. Anybody else see something that, uh, that was good, good news or a good thing? Uh, I, well, here in Jacksonville specifically, I, I mean, I guess it's, it's a good thing that I was able to just a, maybe a week and a half ago, I was able to walk into like a Walgreens or it was either a Walgreens or a CVS. And I was able to just walk into the store. You know, you see these, these videos of like Costco and these Publixes and the line is wrapped around the building all the way to the back with people picking up toilet paper. But here locally, at least, it doesn't seem like people are lining up to actually get like flu medicine, which is kind of weird because you would want, you know, the odds are, I think they said around 60 to 70% of the population is going to get this thing. And it's going to be like a crappy flu for the most of us. You're going to want some like NyQuil and DayQuil. So I, I went in and picked up some extra for us. And, and man, I was just able to walk into the store and, and, and pick up some extra medicine, some Tylenol, Advil, DayQuil, NyQuil, that sort of thing. So uh, my sister recently called me and was like, hey, you know, this thing, I, I've heard you talk about this thing and, and you've been talking to mom and dad and talking to them about what they need to pick up. What do you, what do you think I need to pick up? I'm like, get some medicine first. You know, you're going to want to get something in case you get sick, you know, help you through all this. But at least locally, I don't know what you guys have seen recently, but in your areas, but it doesn't seem like people are hitting up the uh, CVSs and Walgreens for medicine as they are with like this crazy toilet paper run. I had the same exact thought on Sunday and I, I had bought food because I didn't have any food in my apartment really. I had some, you know, beans. I'd probably have weeks worth of beans at hamburger helper. But uh, on Sunday I was like, you know, what if I get it? I, I bet that once this hits and it gets bad, I'm going to want some Mucinex and Dimatap. And it was completely stopped. Like it was, you know, who, you know, what was gone is I'm addicted to Afrin and uh, all, the, all the good shit was gone. So uh, fortunately, Amazon's delivering me my 32 pack so I, I can survive the apocalypse of my African addiction. But yeah, I, I think the, the reality is most people, there isn't a person on the planet alive that lived through the last pandemic in 1918. And so I don't think anybody knows how to process this. And so everybody kind of falls back on what they're pre-programmed, which is a blizzard or a hurricane, which is why you're seeing a ton of bottled water being sold. Like why your taps are going to work, your grocery stores are going to be open, your banks are going to be open. Like you're not going to see, I, I think because people, their, their only experience with anything like this is Outbreak or I Am Legend or Walking Dead, that they think that it's going to get pretty bad. And, and honestly, I think the, uh, you know, being a libertarian for 12 years, having stewed in the doom Paul society, uh, just didn't have to be this way. And this is how it's all going to end. I mean, I remember Hashtag it's happening. Exactly right. Like I remember 2008 when I was a new libertarian, I was just, I had lit, I was so hardcore into like the Ron Paul crowd and listening to him that I just didn't pay my bills for like three months. Because I was just like, there's no reason to pay my credit card because the banks are going to fail at any minute. Lo and behold, that really hurt my credit because the banks didn't fail. And, and so I just think if you if you give in to the panic too much, if you if you're buying massive amounts of bottled water, like I think it's 
there's a fine line between preparing, making sure that you, you know, I saw this, I, I didn't think it was real until last month. Like I thought, oh, this is just Zika. This is just, which swine flu apparently killed 200,000 people across the world, which I didn't know. Cause I just thought that was just another one of these bullshit avian flu type things. But once Italy closed down, I started looking into it last Tuesday, I listened to that Joe Rogan podcast and that guy, Michael, old Meyer or something he scared the hell out of me and i'm like okay all right i'm about a week behind two months a month behind harry and a week behind everybody else and <laughs> i'm a week ahead of most people and so when they figure this out they're just going to start slamming the stores and hitting the supply chains but i was truly mystified by the choices that most people made you know if you buy 14 cans of soup and that is your prep you have now got seven days of meals. <laughs> like, buy a bag of rice and beans. You know what I mean? Like, I, that'll last you a, a, a week, maybe. So I, I thought the same thing. I've got flu medicine. I got I got stuff like that. The thing that has made me the most hopeful, um, the thing that scares me the most is reading uh, works by professional epidemiologists. <laughs> And I'm wondering if they're like, if, am I reading the Peter Schiff of the epidemiology community? You know, am I reading the Ron Paul of the biology community? I never know. Um, and some of that stuff has scared me and I've got it printed out, but they're apparently Neil Ferguson at Hoover posted it. Uh, he wrote this article and that's apparently the thing that woke everybody up. Uh, if you go to the group and you go to our, our uh, tagged announcement where we're, we're collecting links, I posted that PDF in there. Um, but the thing that made me feel the best was an interview that I did today that I posted to the We Are Libertarians podcast feed for my public affairs program on the weekend here called Now Hear This. And it was the woman who runs the um, special pathogens unit at the biggest network hospital in Indiana. And I just felt like she was so competent and she was so prepared and she was like, yes, we have all these reserves and the state has been planning for this for 20 years. And so like for all the talk of there not being planning and not being testing and Donald Trump has messed this up, like you talk to this person who's in charge of the response for the largest hospital and she's prepared. And she's like, the, the, we may have, we may have a, a chance to not be Italy here. So I thought that that, I think finding information through the past week has both been really high and really low in terms of my emotions. But I, I just think learning about all this has, has been probably the most comforting through yeah. all of it. There's a ton of, of pressure to overreact or underreact to this problem. In, in different ways. And I think that it, they want to push you into the camp of it's nothing and it's the sniffles and do nothing, or this is the end of times, like you said, walking dead type of scenario and not real, and you lose perspective on it. I think this is something that kind of happened with global warming and it's put us in this mentality, either you're a denier or you believe we need to put all businesses under government control. And it's like, well, I, I think there might be a maybe more of a middle ground solution on this. Have you guys noticed that there's more be, I've had some explosive fights even among close groups of friends. We have these groups of chats. Have you noticed, have you noticed a little bit more fighting, like more tension there? I, I oh, mean, no, you fucking bitch. <laughs> absolutely. I've noticed uh, people on edge and uh, chicken little syndrome running about in certain group chats that uh, we've been in. Had a very entertaining discussion just, uh, what was it, Monday? In the Wall Coal Mine? Yeah, that was great. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, you know, we, no, we've I got think our... Let's call it what it is. I think, Paul, do you think this is all bullshit? Or, like, what's your deal? You just seem to be... No, uh, I really think you hard. are... I think you're misunderstanding my points that I've been trying to make, which is that uh, people on their own are going to make uh, informed or even uninformed decisions, and they're going to decide whether or not it's a risk that they're willing to take to go out to a restaurant or to go to the theater. Uh, and, you know, staying open is a risk that the uh, 
business owners themselves are deciding whether or not they're going to take or whether or not they're not willing to take. But I think the argument then, if I'm going to play devil's advocate, because I'll admit, Paul, I'm closer to your camp than anybody else's, is that what about those guys who went to the theater and then go to the grocery store? Those guys who went out, I mean, I think most of you guys are probably seeing spring break in Florida right now. The, I mean, they don't care, right? They just you don't have, care. Yeah, I think the part of the problem and that we'll, what we've kind of been privately discussing, because to be candid openly discussing a lot of things right now it's not that we don't want to do it it's just that before we say anything out loud we want to make sure that we understand what we believe um and so we've kind of been going back and forth about the close the mandatory closings i think everybody um i wouldn't say everybody i think that within even our circles uh the, the debate has kind of been almost like you exist in a vacuum and if you like the way that i look at this is that if you are going out to bars or you're on the beach i think most of society as of today feels those people at the beach are irresponsible i don't think they felt that way monday or friday and this has been the most crucial week in terms of the spread of the disease and so if you're somebody, I have become more hardcore and militant about when I see people posting stuff on Instagram stories, like, who do they think they are? You know what I mean? And I'm sure you, the listener has have kind of had that too. It's like, in the beginning, you didn't think this is a big deal. And now you look at it and you're, you're kind of like, it's, you're falling down this rabbit hole um, as you start to pay attention to what's going on in Europe. And, uh, and I am firmly in the camp that if you are going to bars and restaurants right now, you're a bad actor. I think those people that are on the beach are bad actors and that their presence on the beach, their callous, their willful ignorance and their decision means that somebody in their social circle is probably going to lose their life. And I think that those people, I, I'm, I, I, you can't hold them accountable because you can't prove that they had anything to do with it. But I do think that if those people come back and then the grandparent dies nine, 10 days later, there's a correlation there and they're going to feel terrible. Um, and so when you start talking about closing the bars on St. Patrick's Day and you look at what happened in Italy and in China, like Wuhan didn't cancel their potluck dinner. They had an outbreak. They said, it's fine. They had their family potluck dinner with 40,000 families. And the city with 60 million people in the metro area and 15 million in the city was lit on fire by it because of people's will for, will for ignorance and, and their lack of regard for other people. And so the question becomes, where do, where do your rights and my rights start to really interconnect? Because this is, the, this is the only time in my life that I've ever seen those deep philosophical questions of libertarianism actually in practice. This is the only time where it's actually been a life or death situation where we've had one of this, let's say you have an STD and you go out, like we've always had those conversations at the bar as libertarians, but this is a situation where if you were all in a bar and we chose to be there, we're putting someone else's life at risk. And so are you held responsible? Is the moral choice to stay home? I think so. And I think everybody in this chat thinks so. But what do you do with the bad actor who threatens the lives of the community because they're willfully ignorant, they don't want to look at the facts, they don't believe the facts, and they go out and they party and they make it exponentially worse within the community and, and end up killing someone. So that's the argument that we've kind of had behind the scenes. And it's, and it's not a matter of state action. I don't think the discussion has necessarily been, should the state step in and force those bars to close? There may be some people in the group who think that's a yes, but even in an anarcho-capitalist utopian community, uh, I would absolutely argue that your choice to go to a bar on St. Patrick's Day threatens my family's ability to survive. And so therefore I would want to, I don't know, I don't know if you'd use force or enact some part of your anarcho HOA to, to diminish crowds, but I think that uh, we, we had the choice 
to act rationally, and many of us have chosen to do that. In the NBA, the NCAA, these are people who chose to walk away from billions of dollars to act rationally. And so, I mean, I have to, to jump off of here soon because I've got to head home, but I think maybe that's a topic that could be open for discussion tonight because uh, I just, you know, that's kind of been a, a, a heated topic because it's been in text, but I don't, I, I think everybody's kind of on the same page. We're not really for state action, meaning a local government or a federal government I, so, I don't think there's anybody that believes that the federal government should do, should do anything. Yeah. So. so I will tell you what I saw after uh, Kentucky shut down restaurants and bars at, I believe it was five o'clock or no, it was two o'clock uh, instead of five o'clock, which was Indiana. Uh, and I saw every single family at having in this community, having at least one representative in the Kroger that I went to shop at. So instead of announcing a phased in, uh, hey, we're going to be asking you to go, say, Tuesday to uh, drive through or take out only and reducing the initial impact, you had everybody congregate at a single point, which is your big box retailer grocers. And, you know, at this point, you know, if there was somebody there who was infected and contagious, I've been exposed because I had not enough food to last me a day, let alone a week in this place I'm staying. So this is something, let's, let's go ahead. I know Chris had to hop off. This is a debate I want to have, but not on this edition. So, because I, I have feelings about it. Like I said, Paul, I might be closer to you. I think like Chris said, most people in this chat are probably a little closer to him. And I think it's an important discussion. And I think it's something that we rational people uh, in this chat can have. But I do want to give everybody an opportunity to kind of send off. I think we've got enough time for everybody. Uh, Chris had to hop off, but I want everybody to take about two minutes. And if you just want to get a message out there to anybody listening to anybody on the network, we've got a lot of people commenting right now, just saying they need some they just needed somebody to talk to them about it and it's been good. And so I just want everybody to take a, you know, two or three minutes to just share your final thoughts on this. Um, I guess we'll just share it in the same order we win. And Keaton, why don't we, well, we start with you. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm in no position to offer advice to anybody, but it, it, I'll give out the same advice that I gave to my own family. I was the, obviously the, the, the best advice I've heard online is to treat this thing as if you have it already. Treat it as if you have it already. Keep your distance. Obviously, you don't want to get your loved ones sick. You don't want to get your family sick. Um, the tricky thing about this virus is you can be carrying it and not show any symptoms for well over a week. Um, so just, you know, practice uh, social distancing like they've recommended. Um, but as far as if you haven't gotten supplies yet get medicine first um make sure you have some food um if, for the majority of people if you're going to get this it's going to be a crappy flu it's going to suck you're going to be out of commission for around two weeks don't worry about it keep the ones that are um, vulnerable in mind keep your distance from those people even if you don't feel sick protect the ones that are, uh, are vulnerable those would be my recommendations Remzo. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things I always reflect on during any difficult societal problem is uh, what Mr. Rogers said at a Purdue University, I think it was Purdue uh, commencement he spoke at, and he was referencing his mother. And basically, as a kid, Mr. Rogers remembers seeing something terrible on the news, and he was afraid. He was a child, so he saw things as a child, and he asked his mom, what, what do we do about this? And his mother said to him, don't look at the aftermath of the problem. Look at the helpers, because in every situation, there will always be good people out there. Um, you know, I'm not trying to exaggerate when I say that this is the 9-11 of a new generation, but even through the midst of an of a human action like that, even though we're dealing with something that, you know, it's an invisible enemy, we can't combat it with guns or traditional means. We're seeing bravery in so many people. Chris's mom, who is risking her own health to help people. We're seeing 
people working additional hours to make sure that the shops are, you know, still st stocked and they're trying to give good customer service, knowing that they're having to be out of their home. Uh, the truckers that are working overtime, people that are offering to go get grab milk and basic necessities for the elderly stores are changing their hours to accommodate people with weakened immune systems. What we're seeing right now is a great example of American bravery on a level that people only think they can really reference and near near past but now we're actually seeing it so continue to look at that and just continue to look out for the silver linings i'm a giant comic book nerd and my brother and i uh last friday went to go see bloodshot with vin diesel which is for the record i'm a vin diesel fan so i'm somewhat biased but i think bloodshot is his best movie and as we were leaving the theater and one we were like the only people there because at that point I, we were still kind of thinking ah oh, maybe this isn't that big of a deal then you know a few days later we're like okay this is a big deal but my brother was asking me he's like you know all these movies are getting postponed and uh, postponed indefinitely and like people are freaking out about this. And out of nowhere, he's just like, do you think they'll put Bloodshot on demand pretty soon? And I'm like, it just came out in theaters last week. They're not going to put it on demand. I'm happy to be the person to announce this for any comic book and Vin Diesel fans, but Bloodshot is coming out on demand next week. So crazy, ridiculous things are happening right now. Little stupid things that people like me get excited about. So continue to look out for those acts of bravery, those acts of kindness, and just for the silver linings and the nuance of things that you wouldn't otherwise recognize. All right. And look forward to Bloodshot on demand. Sweet. And Bloodshot uh, on demand. <laughs> Vin Diesel! <laughs> Jacob, go ahead. Well, I had three things, and one of them was exactly find the silver lining. So uh, my silver lining has just been, you know, I, I work a lot, uh, long hours, and right now I'm basically told only come in if you have to. So I'm getting way more time with my daughter than I've had in a while. So, I mean, yeah, find the silver lining. If it happens to be, you know, you're at home all day, and if you have a kid, like, great. Do You know, that's time that I wouldn't have had before. So I got to find that. But um you know, the other two things I would say is one is control what you can control, you know, like there's value in seeing the, the big numbers, you know, like if I come across, you know, five people and those five people and it just exponentially grows, like, okay, there's a certain point where that information is good to know, but no longer useful for my day to day. So like I personally need to do as much social distancing as I can do, but I'm not going to, I can't sweat or overstress about other people not doing the right thing. You know what I mean? Like I really got to focus on me doing right. And if everyone has that mindset, then collectively it should work out. Um, so, and then the, finally the third one I was going to say is, um, you know, help where you can, you know, uh, I'm very fortunate that, you know, like I think you said as well, Hody, you know, financially, like I'm pretty good right now. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not crazy hurting, but I know some of my friends are going to be. So, you know, if you can, now's the time to have that conversation on the side with your friends, you know, that are, you know, close relatives. And be like, hey, you know, I know the bills are coming up on the first. You know, help you, you, can, you know, uh, oh, that was weird. Okay. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, so help where you can. And if that's the case that you can financially help somebody out, then, you know, do it. Not within the expectation to be repaid, maybe, you know, just like, look. On the first, you're, you know, you are a waitress at fill in the blank restaurant. I know you're not going to be able to pay your electric bill. Like, I'll cover down on that. And, you know, I think it's we're at that position right now where we really have to start looking to our left and right and just identifying those needs in our close circle of friends. Like, I cannot solve the U.S. economic issue, but I can solve my friend at church who has four kids. You know, I can help there, you know, so... I think if we all do that, control to control, find the silver lining, I think that'll get you through the day at least. So that'd be my advice on it. Awesome. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, Paul, take us home. Uh, I think the most important thing that people can do right now is to understand their risk factors and the risk factors of those that they come into daily contact with. Uh, I'm not going to lie about you know, not being happy with the restaurant closures, the bar closures, all of that. I think it is draconian. But from my vantage point, I understand my risks. You know, I'm young. I have relatively good health. Uh, you know, I'm in the lower risk categories. And I don't come into contact with at-risk uh, communities very often. Uh, but 
the but for me you know taking a calculated risk is different than say Hody in his job is going to have a lot of contact i mean it's uh you work at a certain buffet restaurant that is uh well known for having fearless patrons that are older uh so you know your risk factors are completely different and i think everybody should just be mindful you know you're not going to be able to mitigate 100 percent of your risks but take the risks you can intelligently yeah for sure. Yeah. So yeah, we got the chocolate fountain in my job. And uh, if you guys are ever wanting to feel the coronavirus, just, just saddle on up and try it. If you can find one that's still open. <laughs> um, yeah. So my final thoughts, I just think we, now's the best time to work on your conversation skills. I have found that I've got, you know, I, I think everybody has different groups, right? You'd have different circles. And I have a group of like my brothers and our friends. And then I have, of course, the weird libertarians group. And then I, I have, you know, work groups and all of us, all three of those have gotten in kind of big fights, you know, uh, they've gotten personal. And right now, I think we all feel like, oh, I have to cut off this leg. And I'm sorry that you're that leg, but I just have to cut you off for me to live. Or this group is more important. And you can find yourself easily making an argument that says, I don't care about your grandma. And I don't care about, or I don't care about the experts, or I don't care about the nurses, or I don't care about the people who are working at restaurants. Or I'm just willing to sacrifice this group for that group. And that is not at all what has to happen here, especially in conversation. I think when we talk about libertarian solutions, we're not talking about throwing grandma under the bus. We need to have grandma in the forefront of our minds. We're not talking about throwing these small business owners of the, you know, under the bus. We need to have them in the forefront of their mind. I think that you'll find that everyone feels unrep underrepresented in this conversation, everybody across the nation. It just says nobody, they feel like nobody's representing their point of view except for CNN or Fox News or whatever they're, they're you know, usually it's some very tribal representation. And I think right now we need to say, I need to care about that person as much as their son or daughter or brother or their employee or employer, you know, and become that person when you have that conversation. I'm not saying to constantly play devil's advocate, but just keep the people who aren't present at that table in that discussion in mind and become very selfless during this time. And it's okay to say, hey, you know what, my experience was this, that lends a lot of credence to the conversation to say that, hey, you know, I've actually had this real experience, you know, so you need to understand this. But I also, that doesn't mean that your experience isn't real, you know, and so I think that's really important for us to keep in mind right now. Anyhow, guys, I thank everybody so much to join, for joining us. We're going to have this um, every night, 7 o'clock, either me or Chris hosting. Sometimes it's going to be just a few of us. Sometimes it's going to be open to a lot of us. But uh, thanks to all the contributors here today. Uh, so many. I can't even list them by name. Uh, but th they've done a great job, and we're, we're grateful to have them and all the different perspectives that we have on We're Libertarians. Um, and we're grateful for you, the listener, obviously the Patreon supporters, and everybody who just supports us and listens to us and shares us around. And we're just, we are grateful to be able to talk to you and we're grateful for your feedback to talk to us. I want you to know that we have an ongoing uh, link that talks about all of the things that all of the information that you've sent us about COVID. We've got everything from nurses to just people in other countries that are saying, Hey, here's what it's like. And we're kind of compiling right now that right now. And you'll kind of see the culmination of that research during these next two weeks when we have these coronavirus updates. So again, thank you so much. That's not our last uh, journey tonight. We'll be doing some reaction videos here in just a few minutes that are going to be a lot more fun and a lot more exciting, but uh, either way, guys, thank you so much again, everybody in the chat. Thank you. Uh, and have a good one.